Okay, hello everyone today's webinar, Optimizing 3D Spheroid Models for Efficient Drug-Induced Liver Injury Screening. My name is Sue Grepper. I'm a Senior Application Scientist for Inspiro located on the West Coast of the U.S. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, you may have noticed when you logged in to sign up for this webinar that we have a series of different webinars um, relating to lots of different topics that we are involved with at Inspiro. And there is another one related specifically to toxicology that's more of a mechanistic approach. So I hope you and your colleagues may take a look and sign up for that one as well. You will see as an attendee, you can ask questions at any point during this webinar. So please do, and I will get to them at the end. And uh, let's get started. What I'd like to share with you today is, first and foremost, how the liver toxicology field is moving toward more predictive models so they can lower liver toxicity induced drug attrition rates. I'll show how human 3D liver models consistently outperform traditional 2D hepatocyte cultures and the requirements needed for 3D models to be predictive drug induced liver uh, injury screening, uh, otherwise known as DILI. I'd also like to dispel the myth that 3D models are very expensive. If done appropriately, 3D model screening can be a cost-effective alternative to 2D and DIY models. Lastly, since no model is perfect for every situation, I'd like to share some new industry trends that we're seeing for predictive liver toxicology. First, I'd like to set the stage why accurate predictive toxicology is so critically important to the drug development process. Liver toxicity can halt a potential blockbusters drug's progression at the preclinical, clinical, and post-market level. Many liver toxicities are not detected early, and therefore DILI is a major uh, cause of late-stage clinical drug attrition, black box warnings, market withdrawal, even possible liver failure or death. By this point, millions or even billions of dollars have been spent by the drug developer, and humans' lives have been put at risk. As you can imagine, better ways of accurately predicting DILI has been a major focus for toxicologists and clinicians for several decades. So that leads me to the question, why is drug development so challenging? Why weren't preclinical models properly identifying these hepatotoxic liabilities? Animal models have been used for over a century now, but besides the expense and the ethical issues around using animal models for research, there are so many reports that animals do not recapitulate the same expression of transporters or metabolic enzymes as humans, and therefore the same sensitivity to toxicants. The first in vitro human options were hepatic cell lines such as hep T2 cells. And perhaps some of you have tried these cells at some point in your career as there is an infinite supply of, of these for repeated experiments. However, you then also know that metabolic enzyme expression is severely lacking and nuclear receptors regulating these enzymes are non-functional due to decades of passaging. More recently, perhaps 20 years ago, primary human hepatocytes became commercially available for use either in suspension or 2D plated culture. Even more impressive was the fact that you could get these primary cells cryopreserved, so you could use the same primary donor again and again until that donor cells run out. Because of their human biological uh, relevance, primary plated hepatocytes have since been the in vitro gold standard for testing liver toxicants. However, there have been numerous reasons, for example, short lifespan or rapid de-differentiation that occurs when hepatocytes are cultured in 2D that result in clear deficits in hepatotoxicity predictivity. Therefore, more complex primary human models have been generated which allow these cryopreserved hepatocytes to survive much longer than that of 2D and to function much more in vivo-like. As you can imagine, a human cell, which functions more like it did in the body, would also similarly respond better to toxicants. Extensive validation of in vitro to in vivo translation has been published numerous times, including this 2016 paper from the Karolinska Institute. This image from the paper nicely highlights the differences between the same human donor represented 2D hepatocytes versus 3D spheroids at the proteomic level. It also shows how the 3D spheroids, which were cultured in ultra-low attachment plates, closely resemble the in vivo liver as represented by a liver slice from that same donor. What we're seeing here is a heat map visualizing whole proteome analyses of primary human liver samples after 24 hours and seven days in a 2D culture compared to spheroid cultures after seven days. 
you'll notice that the in vivo liver samples in black and spheroids in green cluster closely together, while the proteomes of samples cultured in 2D, 24 hours in blue, seven days in red, are distinctly different. The principal component analysis, or PCA, clearly separates proteomes from liver and 3D spheroids from that of the 2D cultured samples. Lastly, inter-individual differences observed in vivo are still preserved in 3D culture, with each of the 3D samples clustering with a respective liver piece from that same donor. So, research emerging from numerous groups like the Karolinska Institute and in Sphero is showing that the characteristics of 3D spheroid models, which I'll get into in upcoming slides, they allow these models to bridge the gap from 2D to the clinic. The use of 3D cultures in the drug development process, perhaps completely replacing other preclinical models, really opens new opportunities for discovery and safety. But to do so, there are several critical validations that need to be performed to ensure that your 3D model is produced and cultured in a manner that maintains these characteristics. The big question is um, that we all ask is, in order to mimic in vivo hepatocytes, hepatotoxicity uh, in vitro, what features are important to recapitulate? First of all, an in vitro model should be multicellular, not just hepatocytes, but also non-parenchymal cells and combined in a physiologically relevant manner. The addition of the other cell types is important, not only because they also exist in the liver, but because they might have a contributing factor to toxicity. And we'll get into this a bit further in my presentation. An interesting and important aspect of 3D culture is the ability to allow the cells to self-aggregate. As opposed to 2D culture, there is no need for an artificial collagen membrane to attach to, because if you use the right media and plates for 3D aggregation, the connectivity between the cells make their own extracellular matrices. The self-assembly allows for incredible longevity compared to 2D cultures. Cultural longevity is really important because clinical and post-marketing data have shown that some drug toxicities, for example, the schizophrenia drug chlorpromazine, they don't appear for several weeks in vivo. Also, in order to replace traditional 2D methods earlier in drug development, spheroid should be amendable for high throughput screening, meaning in both 96 well as 3D4 well plates. And with very small volumes, if you have the protocols that have been optimized for 3D culture, meaning less than 2,000 cells, it can allow for an impressive collection of endpoints. And this has actually been one of the major focuses at Inspiro these past 10 or so years. So that brings me to why I'd like to discuss the advantages of using 3D spheroids for liver toxicity. I could actually spend hours talking about this because when you're talking about drug toxicity in the liver, there are two main areas. One is DILI screening, where you're trying to accurately identify toxic compounds before they get too far along in the clinical trials. And the other area is when you've already identified a drug to be toxic, and you would like to have better understanding of the mechanism of toxicity, and whether other supporting data, say in vivo rat or vivo dog data, would ultimately translate to toxicity in man. For the sake of time, I will save the translational discussion for my colleagues in an upcoming seminar. So please do check our website for the schedule. Rather, today I will focus exclusively on predictive toxicology and show what we have found at Inspira to be important characteristics of a 3D model um, for predicting liver toxicity. Because visual staining can tell an insightful story of biological relevance and frankly, 3D cultures are cool to look at, we have performed extensive characterization of our own 3D liver microtissues through imaging techniques. What I'm showing here are microtissues harvested seven days after seeding for staining and immunohistic chemistry analysis or IHC. These microtissues were fixed, embedded in paraffin and sectioned into roughly five micron sized sections. On the left, you can see H&E staining of the cell membranes combined with DAPI nuclear staining to show the compact cellular architecture of the microtissue. Periodic acid shift staining, or PAS, nicely reflects glycogen production, which is a key function of hepatocytes. The brown CD68 staining represents Kupfer cells, and brown CD31 staining represents endothelial cells. BCEP, or biosol export pump, is a key efflux transporter responsible for removing bile acids from hepatocytes into biocanalicular networks. It is really insightful that we see this distinct staining of BCEP because you won't see this in most 2D cultures. 
if you've worked with primary hepatocytes in 2D, you know that uh, you will need this level of qualification in order to get close to a fully confluent monolayer. Without high confluency in 2D, without tight hepatocellular connections, the hepatocytes will flatten out to de-differentiate and lack the polarity that is key to their function in vivo. Without polarity, BCEP and the other efflux transporters will not align properly on the apical sides of hepatocytes, and these crucial biocanalicular networks will not reform. And you can see here, very nice representation of these reestablished networks containing the BCEP transporter and brown staining. We can also perform immunofluorescence staining quite easily, and unlike IHC, this technique allows for co-staining multiple complementary components of the cell. Here we harvested, fixed, and cryosectioned microtissues after 20 days in culture, and images were acquired using a ZEIS LSM microscope. Yes, uh, LSM microscope. So the cryosections were stained for CYP3, forward albumin, and the top images, which both represent important functions of hepatocytes in vivo. As opposed to the BCEP staining on the last slide, here we stain for BCEP as well as another imported transporter, MRP2. You can see how these efflux transporters are aligning in the little Y-shaped grooves as you would see in liver biopsies. This reflects the reformation of the critical biocanalicular networks. Lastly, and this is my favorite image, you can see very distinct staining of eucadherin. This is very insightful because eucadherin is a cell-cell adhesion molecule that plays a pivotal role in the development and maintenance of hepatocyte polarity on the basal lateral sides of hepatocytes. So all of these combined images show from a visual perspective how critical cellular functions are maintained in these microtissues and after 20 days in culture. Besides visual characterizations, we always quantify certain parameters every time we test new hepatocyte MPC co-culture combinations. Here we have three different individual hepatocyte donors in co-culture represented by red, blue, and yellow donors with the same lot of MPCs co-cultured. Each row represents a different measurement of these microtissues. In the first row, microtissue diameter is assessed in our specific InSphero accurate plates using ImageJ software. You can see that the same diameter is maintained throughout the course of 35 days, meaning cells haven't died and sloughed off into the media. ATP content within the microtissues is represented in the second row as a marker of metabolic activity. And we use a cell titer glow protocol, which has been optimized for 3D cultures. Again, we see quite stable ATP levels over the course of five weeks within a single donor. Lastly, as I mentioned earlier, albumin secretion is an important marker of hepatocyte functionality, and we can assess it by using an albumin ELISA. We see stable levels through day 28 before albumin starts to drop significantly. A critical function of hepatocytes is metabolism, which is often responsible for either the deactivation of a toxic parent drug or bioactivation of a toxic metabolite. Therefore, an essential feature of a preclinical tox model is representation of these human metabolic pathways. Cytochrome P450, or CYP enzymes, are the most relevant enzymes to drug metabolism, and therefore drug toxicity. We wanted to show that our microtissues were metabolically competent, and competent over time, because as I mentioned earlier, anyone who's worked with 2D hepatocyte cultures knows that plating hepatocytes in a dish de-differentiates them significantly within the first 24 hours, and you see a massive drop in albumin secretion and CYP expression. So here we are looking again at those same three hepatocyte donors represented by different colors and cult cultured with the same lot of Cooper cells and endothelial cells, but now measuring different CYP activities using specific probe substrates for those CYPs over the course of time. Each graph represents a different CYP enzyme. With all of these markers I've shown you so far, there is less difference over time, but rather greater differences between the three donors tested here. And this should be expected due to human variation. You can really see this when looking at specific CYP activities, for there is a significant percentage of the population who are known as CYP poor metabolizers. If you look at the figure in the middle, for example, the red donor here is one of the 10% of the Caucasian population who lacks significant CYP 2D6 activity because of a genetic variation. For that reason, and because of commercial availability around 2017 or so, we moved from using individual donors to pooled human donor hepatocytes that would better represent the average population. 
On the subject of necessary requirements for reproducible 3D culture, here's an example of a current certificate of quality, which is created from every bi-weekly production of liver tissues that we produce at Inspiro. You can see a little microtissue in each well of this 96 well plate, and the diameters of these microtissues are strictly regulated at our facility with a strict adherence for plus minus 10% deviation. ATP content must also meet a certain threshold as well, and we set aside an entire produced plate from each production for these ATP measurements. This is critical for our clients that work with us on a regular basis to know that we guarantee reproducibility from week to week. I should point out that we are able to achieve each of these tight standards through our robotics and automation process, which I'll admit gives us quite an advantage over manual techniques. Without automation, there will inevitably be some human error entering into the aggregation process, regardless of the skill level. And this could result in variation of spheroid size, different ratios of different cell types, even introduction of dead or unhealthy cells that will ultimately decrease the culture longevity. So a frequent question we get is, since we at Inspira are using primary hepatocytes, how different are different pooled lots to each other? Because compared to Hep G2 cells, there's not an infinite amount of primary cells to use forever. I will say that every time we are transferring or transitioning, I guess, to a new lot, we do extensive characterization comparisons between the lots. This includes SIP activities, ATP levels, and even SIP induction capabilities between lots, as I'm showing here on this slide. The two rows represent two different donor combinations, and we've tested SIP inducers rifampicin and omeprazole for their effects on respected targeted SIP enzymes. These measurements are important not because we're trying to market this model for SIP induction screening, which you certainly could use it for, but rather to show that the important nuclear receptors, uh, PXR, AHR, and CAR, are still appropriately expressed and functioning. In cell lines such as HEPG2 cells, these nuclear receptors are diminished and therefore the SIP activities these nuclear receptors regulate are greatly reduced. So all of these characteristics I've been describing so far, the tight cell-cell connections, polarity, albumin secretion, functioning metabolic enzymes, nuclear receptor expression, why these characteristics are so important to maintain in 3D in vitro models is because these characteristics allow the cells to act more in vivo-like, much more so compared to other in vitro models, such as suspension or 2D plated cultures. Therefore, it is expected that these 3D models should also respond more appropriately to toxic and safe compounds. Here I'm showing the comparison of two different pooled donor lots for their ability to detect toxicity of compounds ketoconazole, tolcapone, and tolcapone structurally related but safe, and tacapone. As we do in our standard DILI services, we used a seven point concentration curve, and here we measured from 10 nanomolar up to 10 micromolar. Again, we're using ATP as our toxicity endpoint. You can see that for each compound, both donor combinations in our 3D liver model demonstrated very similar curves, and therefore very similar IC50 values. Both kinoconazole and tocopone were indeed toxic, and their calculated margin of safety meaning the IC50 value generated divided by the known Cmax was much lower than 30. 30 is a measurement that many researchers are now using as a guideline for a cutoff for drug safety. And tacopone never reached an IC50 value, and again this is a safe compound, and even when an estimated IC50 value is inserted for the margin of safety calculation, it is still greater than 30, again which would classify it as safe or DILI negative. Now, building the toxicology ar argument for 3D models, some might ask, why is it important to gain other primary cells uh, besides hepatocytes, such as Cooper cells and endothelial cells, since liver toxicity mainly occurs within the hepatocytes? This is a great question, and it is important to point out the role of idiosyncratic toxicity of drugs. There are many examples of drugs that make it to the market, or make it to the clinic and even to the market, only later to be removed because of rare idiosyncratic toxicity. In some cases, as it was with a broad spectrum antibiotic trovofloxacin, inflammatory markers were also heightened in these patients, indicating drug-induced hepatitis. For these compounds to be accurately identified before the clinic, the inflammatory cells like Kupfer cells must be present in the model. That is why we add Kupfer cells into our 3D tox model at Insphero. <clears throat> 
Furthermore, we validate each new lot to make sure that the Kupfer cells are initially unactivated, but proven to be readily inducible by LPS, which is the immunogenic membrane component of gram-negative bacteria. In this graph, you'll see that the Kupfer cells we use in our model are initially unactivated, and you can't see control data bars because there isn't any activity here, but then the activation potential of the Kupfer cells, as measured by cytokine IL-6 release, is maintained over the course of several weeks. This is important because you want to ensure that all cell types are still represented throughout the duration of the culture, that certain cell populations are not dying and sloughing off into the media. I'd like to show some examples of why the resident liver cell, uh, resident liver immune cell, the Kupfer cells, should be present in DILI screening. Coming back to the antibiotic trophofloxacin, this compound was not toxic in their preclinical rodent models and also passed clinical trials back in 1998. However, once on the market, over 150 severe hepatic reactions were reported, 10% of which reported uh, resulted in liver failure, making the incident of trovofloxacin induced severe hepatotoxicity only one in about 20,000 prescriptions. Liver biopsies of the victims revealed central lobular hepatic necrosis and also inflammatory cells were highly concentrated at the peripheral edges of the central lobular necrosis. Therefore, we've tested trovofloxacin in our model alongside trovofloxacin safe but structurally related levofloxacin in the presence or absence of LPS to see if the stimulation of the liver immune cells shifts the toxicity. Indeed, we did see a shift in trovofloxacin toxicity, but no toxicity was observed with levofloxacin with or without the inflammatory LPS stimuli. So, so far in this webinar, I've been sharing the characteristics required of 3D cultures for predictive toxicology testing. But since I've been sharing a lot of our own internal validation data, I admit that this may come across as a bit biased. So I'd like to share a case example study with you. Because of lack of predictivity of their models at the time, around 2017 or so, which were 2D hepatocytes cultured for 48 hours, Genentech and AstraZeneca wanted to do a large evaluation of their standard model versus the same hepatocyte donor incorporated into our 3D model, containing Kupfer cells and endothelial cells for 14 day exposure. This was quite a large collaboration and was led by Will Proctor at Genentech and Dominic Williams at AstraZeneca. In order to capture a wide range of different types of known toxic and safe compounds, 110 compounds in total were tested, which were categorized from category one, meaning severe DILI, up to category five, meaning no DILI. Eight drug concentrations were tested up to 100 C max, if possible. And then these compounds were classified based on ATP, ICV values, or margin of safety threshold, again, which is IC50 over the total plasma CMAX. Here are some examples I pulled out from the paper, but of course, we will send you a link to this paper after the webinar for you to spend some time on if you like. The row on the top highlights some category one severe DILI compounds, losantin, ketoconazole, flutamide, and troglitazone, and how the 3D culture listed as 3D LIMT and solid black dots has a much lower IC50 value, if any at all, compared to 2D, listed as PHH for the primary human hepatocytes. The middle row likewise represents DILI category two, where compounds such as simvastatin never reach an IC50 value in 2D. But what I think is most impressive is that our model better predicted drugs in category three, as these might be the most likely to slip through the cracks of drug development. Chlorpromazine is a drug that is considered category three, is considered idiosyncratic because of its rare but dangerous occurrences in the clinic. And we observed very distinct differences between the two models. For this reason, this DILI category three drug, chlorpromazine, serves as our positive control within all of our routine DILI services. In the end, our 3D model was twice as sensitive for detecting the true DILI compounds than the same donor cultured in their standard 2D culture conditions. 18 of the 70 true, true DILI compounds in categories one, two, and three were only detected in our model using 30-fold as the margin of safety threshold that you see in this chart. Many of these drugs were removed from the market or blackboxed. So we have to ask ourselves, what could have been saved if some of these drugs toxicities were detected much earlier 
Troglitazone and cetaxitin are examples of DILI category one, meaning severe DILI, but both of these made it to the clinic. It's interesting to see that for both of these drugs clinical trials, there was only a tiny percentage of subjects which displayed any liver toxicity in terms of elevated transaminases. For troglitazone, there ended up being almost 500 cases of liver failure after it made it to the clinic and almost a billion dollars paid out in settled lawsuits. Both of these compounds toxicities were picked up in the 3D model, but not the standard 2D model. I thought this quadrant diagram would be interesting to show the reality of the relationships between model complexity, physiological relevance, and actual cost to run these different types of studies. It's pretty clear that 3D spheroids and in vivo animals are more complex than 2D monocultures. When it comes to physiological relevance, in vivo animals certainly have all the extra hepatic components, but they lack relevance to human liver and to humans in general. When it comes to cost of an experiment, I think the misconception about 3D spheroid screening as very expensive has been going to the wayside. The reality is if you have a reproducible and at least semi-throughput way of producing and culturing 3D spheroids, the costs are surprisingly close to that of screening in 2D. And there are certainly less expensive than testing in animals. And that doesn't take into account the potential millions of dollars wasted if your drug isn't tested in a predictive model and then gets removed later in development. Along that last point, everyone knows there's a rush to get a drug to the market. We have to consider that traditional drug toxicity testing typically takes roughly two years mitigating risk as a compound bounces back and forth between in vitro models and vivo models, phase one clinical safety models, and then perhaps back again to preclinical models if some toxicities pop up in the clinic. If a more predictive model could be used right in the beginning, it would potentially save an entire year of resources. Now, this <laughs> webinar was genuinely not uh, designed to be a sales pitch, really just a discussion to help all of us toxicologists find the best scientific approaches to our research. I will say, however, these are interesting times right now in the spring of 2020, and we have been getting a lot of inquiries about how we can help keep tox screening moving for companies whose laboratories are still shut down, while the pressure to get their drugs to the market is still quite real. Therefore, I felt I should mention that we do have productions of these liver microtissues every two weeks that we run both daily services and mechanistic liver tox services with. We also still ship plates of these microtissues from those same productions to researchers that want to perform assays in their own facilities. In working with us, you aren't locked into any one solution. You can start with a service, switch to plates, or use any combination of the two, whatever makes the most sense for your pipeline and staff resources. For example, we're currently working with two large pharma who send us compounds on a routine basis for DILI screening, but then they also receive, receive plates on occasion for specific mechanistic projects they're working on. Unfortunately, these guys are not able to receive plates right now during these interesting months, but they're sending us even more compounds and we are getting the work done for them. So please do know that there are lots of options to work with it at Inspiro because we are fully functional. Okay, back to the science. I did want to mention trends we're seeing in the field as no current model is absolutely perfect for detecting every liver toxicant. As scientists, we should always be thinking forward to even better models. Some of the trends we see include comparing uh, general population to that of individual donors. For example, if you know your compound is exclusively metabolized by CYP2D6 or inhibits CYP2D6, it'd be really interesting to test toxicity in a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer in parallel to that of pool donor lots. We can acquire individual donors that have been genotyped and or phenotyped for numerous traits. To the second point, there have been some examples of drugs like floxacillin that are not only associated with specific genotypes, but are also associated with extremely rare immune-related toxicities. These drugs may not be picked up with the current pooled lots, and additional immune cells might be required. We have started to see a few of our clients who use our tox model in-house, but they add in activated or unactivated PBMCs to see if these rare toxicities can finally be detected. I believe there's some publications coming out in the next six months on this topic. Another point along the lines of specific hepatocyte lots is not a scientific point, but rather one of convenience. We do understand that tox groups sometimes stock up on numerous, if not hundreds of vials of cryopreserved hepatocytes for 2D tox screening in-house. 
Therefore, they're in a tough situation if a year or two into using that lot, they'd like to try advanced 3D cultures with NPCs, but they've already invested quite a lot of money into the vials of hepatocytes. What we found is a really cool compromise is that these groups can send us a percentage of these vials that we would incorporate into our 3D model, including NPCs, for a more complex second tier screen. Lastly, another trend we're seeing is around additional measurements to run alongside ATP, perhaps to confirm which cell type in the cold culture is being affected. For example, some researchers like to measure hepatocyte specific uh, messenger RNA 122 or otherwise known MIR 122 alongside ATP to confirm that the cells affected are actually the hepatocytes. More commonly, however, researchers like to correlate drops in ATP with specific markers for necrosis, and I'd like to spend a moment on this topic. A common misconception about our microtissues is that, since they're comprised of less than a few thousand cells, that it limits the ability to detect additional endpoints beyond ATP. We've actually validated numerous endpoints from these little microtissues, which I won't have time to get in today, but rather I urge you to join our Mechanistic Talks webinar in upcoming weeks that discuss several different endpoints. I will say that one measurement all in vitro models have difficulty measuring is the transaminase AST. Of course, researchers are interested in this endpoint because of the sense of security it gives them to the clinic. However, there simply aren't great kits and protocols available to measure AST from in vitro systems. We did spend a lot of time on this, however, and finally found a very sophisticated machine that could measure AST release. For validation purposes, we tested some DILI compounds showed here that we were quite familiar with and measured ATP from the cell lysates, as seen in the top row, but then also measured LDH leakage in the middle row or AST leakage in the bottom row. We measured the uh, release of these into the supernanes. I will say that we had to generate large microtissues for these studies in order to detect AST. What was quite clear from this and other experiments is that the LDH and AST leakage follow extremely similar patterns to each other, and they also complement very nicely the drop in ATP. Therefore, we feel confident we can offer AST as a measurement, but in reality it is much easier and more sensitive to use LDH as a surrogate for necrosis. But that choice is ultimately up to the researcher because AST values may be better understood by clinicians. So in summary, I hope I've given some useful guidance for what we think is important criteria for accurately predicting DILI in vitro. In order to have a reproducible and accurate model, you will have to ensure you do the following. Number one, use primary cells because they are more representative of in vivo humans and cell lines. You need to include non-parenchymal cells in addition to hepatocytes not only because they are there in the liver, but because they may play a role in toxicity or deactivation. You need to have tight cell-cell connections in order to reestablish the critical hepatocellular polarity that dictates hepatocyte function. You need to maintain metabolic enzyme activities, as well as the nuclear receptors that regulate some of these key enzymes. And lastly, even if you have robotics, you need to check diameters and ATP from every production to ensure reproducibility between productions. If you have done all of these things, you will be in a better place to be more predictive in your research. I will admit this is a difficult checklist to achieve, and if this is outside the bandwidth at your facility, I hope you will consider using Insphero screening services, or at least our QC microtissues in your own lab. Switching to 3D cultures in general should actually save you quite a bit of time, money, and resources in the end. So with that, um, we would love to address any questions that you have posted here. And if you'd like to reach out to me directly, please uh, see my email here. Thank you very much for joining.